Welcome to How I Killed My Mother and Other Confessions by the Mafia Hairdresser. This podcast is filled with episodes of my true confessions, harrowing, horrifying, and sometimes uplifting stories about my hair clients and celebrity friends, and of course, all about my mom issues. This podcast is brought to you by the demons in my head, the angels who told me I should do this podcast, and all the signed and unsigned permission release forms from everyone I mentioned in this podcast. This is your host, John David, aka The Mafia Hairdresser, author of the novels Mafia Hairdresser and The Glow Stick Gods, and and the upcoming book, Murder, there's an app for that, all based on my fantastical, crazy life. You can listen to the serial podcast version of Novel 1 and Novel 2 here at the Mafia Hairdresser Chronicles and wherever you listen to podcasts. And both the books and the hit podcast, along with this one, How I Killed My Mother, available at MafiaHairdresser.com. And now on with this episode of How I Killed My Mother. This episode is called Suicide Note. But before I really get into it, let me tell you, I listen to a lot of podcasts that recount uh, people doing horrible things to other people. True crime and catfish stories and stories of the like. And I listen to stories about psychopaths and sociopaths and narcissists. And many of those podcasts start out with the host stating that their podcast depicts thoughts of suicide and violence and triggering awful things. So just in case it triggers you, I'm going to state in this opening episode that it contains a few thoughts about sadness and despair and it contains stuff about suicide. In fact, I'm going to call this episode Suicide Note because it's like a life when things get so bad in my life and maybe yours. And I've felt shame and there's money problems and shame, 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 blah, blah, blah. And it also includes dogs walking around because this podcast is going to be down and dirty punk rock. I'm just recording it off the top of my head and I'm just going to let it ride. And if it triggers or... It inspires, yay. If it um, brings it down, sorry. If it uplifts you, yay. If it um, is annoying, boo. But if you like it, yay. So this is Suicide Note. So I have had my bouts of feelings that are the opposite of joy, and I have experienced really low points in my well-lived, lucky, and fantastic life. Yet, if I'm being honest with myself and about things and situations or my rock bottoms, if my material possessions and finance, material possessions and finances were not stripped down to the sub-micro levels of comfort and security, and I hadn't gone through what I went through, I wouldn't be the writer today and I wouldn't even be doing this podcast. In the tiny crevice where I have landed, which is the now, and after I've fallen so low in my own life's expectations, which is now, there is no more downward path available for me to take. I have had only the slightest amount of wiggle room to be able to see what I was supposed to do. And I think it was to write about all of it and to tell you in this podcast. In my sadness and stillness and my losses, I was able to find that little bit of an air pocket of clarity on some things. So I'm sharing that with you as well. You see, when you dead end into institution, it offers no choice but for one to begin climbing back up the consciousness scale. They say that rock bottom may be a blessing, and I'm going to believe that that is true. And I'm so sorry if this is dark, but I have to tell you, I am no longer the bright-eyed and optimistic go-getter I used to be. Frankly, I only have a little bit of hope left in my heart that I can achieve what I want to in this physical lifetime. But I'm definitely not going to kill myself. Not today and not soon and probably never. And I was never going to do that, no matter what I have titled this podcast. I've never actually fully considered it. But I get it. I can empathize with those poor souls who might think it's easier to end their life. And then empathize with those poor souls who might think it's easier to end their life. 
In the past 10 years, I know I have suffered from depression, but it wasn't severe depression. I just found it hard to get out of bed and I just didn't want to. And I had those negative looping thoughts. It was just awful. And I drank a little too regularly, like everyone else during the pandemic. But I had a lifetime of spiritual tools in my handbag or my tool bag. And I had a meditation practice. And I had the love of my dogs to keep me focused on moving forward. And I had friends. And I had family. And I'd like to think I relied on them or leaned on them which I don't do enough. But those thoughts of suicide were just one of many self-pitting get-out-of-jail cards I was pondering playing with, like buying lottery tickets or starting a few less-than-business-competent friends. By the way, those who know me know that I am actually brave enough and brazen enough to do away with my own life if I wanted to because I have done some outrageously bold things in my life. And I'll tell you about all of those later. You know, I'm just going to say, I would take the fact that my people, my friends and family, would actually believe I could off myself, and I'd take it as a compliment. Thank you very much. Mm. The maybe thing about suicide, I might commit suicide if I had ALS or Parkinson's or something like that. Um, and it's not because I wouldn't want to be a burden to anyone. I think that's ridiculous. I've had lots of friends and family in hospice care or whatever, and I'll wipe their butt. I don't care. That doesn't bug me. So, uh, but I do think that I've experienced those people and I've seen people with ALS, one of them, I will, one of those people I will tell you about that ha were experiencing these horrible things in beds. They could hardly move and, and talk or speak or let alone blink. And yet these people eke out a little bit of happiness and joy out of every day. I'm just saying maybe I would think about suicide if I didn't think I could eke out that little bit of joy every day which makes me think maybe I wouldn't do it at all. So, but, um, hey, would you like to know how I would do it? Because I will tell you how I would end my life if I decided to do that. If I tell you, it would not be without great sadness, not be without great sadness and reluctant responsibility that by telling you that I know that some listeners may actually want to use my suicide method to end their lives, their own lives. I can only hope that before they kill themselves, that they listen to this entire suicide note episode, this entire podcast, and that we both come to the same conclusion, that life is good, and we might still be able to accomplish what we are meant to do in this lifetime while experiencing joy, even if we have to eat out a little bit every day, and love. I know we can all give love, that's for sure. Now, even if it's hard to believe at the moment, I think we can experience joy and love every day. So we should all agree that suicide is dumb and not an option to eradicate our, say, our sadness. Suicide is not for you and not for me. To those who actually might use my suicide method of choice, please do not credit me. Don't make my method a thing or an endemic wave of death that becomes the latest scourge over America because of what you heard here or you heard on chatter quoted out of context on social fucking media or the news. This is only the first episode, gang. And I know suicide is a big internet subject. I think the jokes and the chatter only make things worse, and I don't want to be part of that. And maybe that's why I'm talking about it. Not for the clicks, but because I think the subject has caught my attention, and not only because I got sad myself, but I don't want anyone to kill themselves. I want you to keep listening so that you and I both can find more hope and then more hope and that I can feel great again. Um, like I did when things were 
quote unquote, better. I'm writing now just to feel anything sometimes and to eradicate numbness that I felt or sadness. But I also want my big dreams back and my big hope. And I know that sometimes it may take a miracle to get out of the messy, soul-crushing state we're in. But I do believe in miracles. And I know there are many people who have had thoughts of how much easier it would be to have to not deal with the situations, the world, social media, sadness, and loneliness, just by simply stopping the very hearts in their bodies. The very hearts that could counteract all the badness and shittiness and sadness if we could just connect to it. I get it. My heart feels innocuous, intangible, broken. I don't guilt or shame for not being there physically or emotionally for my friends and my family lately. And yet, I know those people need me. I've said it before, and I need them. And I need my heart. And I am here to connect again. As a writer, I have discovered well over a hundred ways to kill oneself. You do not want to see my uh, web history browser. You know, for my fictional characters, I, I look up stuff, their demises in my plays and my novels. But I've only come up with about five methods of suicide that my writer research uh, that I would actually use for myself, because if I were to kill myself, it would have to entail an emotionally low impact in regard to the persons who found my body. Jumping off of a balcony of a high-rise is bad form. Tacky. Suicide jumpy stuff is way too mean and an unnecessary messy way to go. Think about it, people. Some innocent service worker has to clean that shit up and you could hurt someone down below. And why would you ruin a random passerbyer's day by splatting on the sidewalk so that someone might walk by and see that crap? The best suicide should not be gross. And if you want to kill yourself, you have got to visualize what people might say afterwards. I know I wouldn't want my family or friends to say, how could he have done it like that? One should always kill oneself with the wish that friends and loved ones would not be left with a visual imagining of the way you offed yourself. If you to yourself, if you kill yourself, I hope your friends and family might say, well, at least he, she, they went peacefully. Of course, that means no guns. Again, gross. Anyway, all right, get ready for it. It's helium. Yeah, that's how I do it. Helium. Helium is tidy. It's clean. And it's clear. By breathing in the proper killing amount of helium, your body and mind will effortlessly feel and think it's falling asleep, and you will lose consciousness. In only under 60 minutes, give or take, your brain and body will cease to work at all. Hey, fun facts. Did you know that helium is the most abundant element in the universe, and yet it is now very rare on Earth? It is considered a non-renewable source, and scientists have not come up with a way to make artificial helium, and yet science and industry have relied on helium from things like making semiconductors to pushing fuel from tanks to engines on rockets. So we need it and we use it all the time. Have you ever been to a uh, party city store? A major part of their business is selling decorative mylar balloons filled with helium. You know, the ones found in sea turtles' dead bodies and mixed in with the giant floating plastic islands in the ocean? Well, decades ago, the owners of that chain began incorporating the knowledge of the inevitable scarcity and the rising cost of helium into their business projections. They knew that helium would eventually not exist and that their business would have to evolve or scale down. So they have already gone through bankruptcy and begun closing stores. So they have already gone through bankruptcy and begun closing stores. 
Interesting, right? But I digress. I must tell you how to properly use helium as a suicide tool. And I don't have to tell you how precious this death formula is because now you know that death by helium can only be used for the next few years. Future generations of self-offers will not have the luxury of helium because there won't be any helium in the near future, unless it's for rockets and blah blah, stuff like that. But for today, here's what you'll need to get the job done. Number one, helium. The first thing you'll need is two, not one, 14 to 15 cubic feet helium canisters. Of course, you can order them at Amazon.com or Walmart. Dot com. You can get smaller canisters, but I feel the larger ones would be best. You don't want to take the risk of them running out mid-suicide. Number two, tubing. You'll need to buy tubing so the balloon you're going to create around your head. Think floor to bed size. That's the length. I'd take one of the canisters with you to Home Depot or Ace Hardware so that you can get the perfect tubing diameter size that will tightly slip on the helium canister spigot, yet not slip off while you nod off. You'll need two tubes. Number three, you're going to need some duct tape. Duct tape is used to seal the balloon around your neck. You should also use it to secure the tubing to the spigot and tape the other end of the tubing to your chest or headboard. And number four is one 65-gallon size to 100-gallon size clear plastic trash bag. That's the big balloon. One of these will be used as the helium balloon that will act as a quote-unquote oxygen tent. Number five is Valium. I recommend 30 mg to 40 mg of Valium, which is diazepam, and that's three, three to four 10 mg pills, I think. Yeah, 50 mg if you're a big person who might have experienced a high tolerance to Valium. So number six is decide who you're going to email uh, your suicide notes to and write your note in advance. Make sure you convert your suicide note to a PDF format. You do not want your email server to flag your email as a suicide note. So when and where you decide to um, release your spirit from your body, it's a very important thing to think about. You do not want to do it in your own home unless you live in a single family home, not attached to other homes. The main thing is that you want to do it in a place where you'll not be disturbed. And if something goes wrong on the other side, the other dimension where your soul goes to, you just don't want to be really stuck there haunting a house that you loved. And you don't want to be really stuck there haunting a house that you loved and, you know, just be there all the time over and over. And think about after you do the deed, like years later, you don't want to pick a place like your home where people who live near you will constantly walk by your dwelling and think that's where he did it. You know, I think it would be best to do it in a hotel room, a nice hotel with a nice bed. To set up, you'll place the helium tanks next to the bed and connect the tubes to the tanks. Secure the tubes to the tanks with some duct tape. Then you should take your 30 meg or 40 meg or 50 meg Valium on an empty stomach. So you'll feel a bit drowsy after about 15 minutes, at which time you would be um, feeling the process. It'll just start mellowing you out, so to speak. If you had a last meal, which was full of fats and carbs, you'll begin your process. I would caution you about the use of alcohol during this process because it impairs your thinking and you don't want to miss a step. After you begin to get calm and drowsy from the Valium, place one clear trash bag and the roll of duct tape near the pillows at the top of the bed. Once all these tools are in place, you should email your pre-written PDF attachment of your suicide note to your main recipient as well as five others. In the subject matter, you say time sensitive. In the body of the email, you'll only state that you want your suicide note recipients to open and read the attached PDF. In the PDF suicide note, you will state why you decided to end your life and give the proverbial apology. This note should not blame anyone or throw out shade or at anyone or throw out shade or accusations. Take responsibility.
Besides, on the other side, you'll probably realize that forgiveness and self-introspection should have been a more of a go-to when you were alive. I think death will most certainly give you a different perspective, and you'll probably regret killing yourself altogether, let alone leaving unkind words about a living person. Also in this note, you'll need to request that your recipient call the proper authorities, such as the police, to come and collect your body, but also state that you will already be long dead, so there will be no need to rush or knock the hotel room door down. Send this email in a time delay of 12 to 24 hours in the future. Just in case your main recipient doesn't open their email right away, the other five recipients will, and at least one of them will call the call. Be too grody to handle by the professional cleanup crew. It only takes about two hours for your body to completely die with helium, so give yourself plenty of time to not be found or interrupted before your spirit leaves your body. By sending your email in a time delay, this ensures you won't be rescued before you're dead. Sadly, if you were interrupted before you actually died, you might wake up with brain damage and be physically and physiologically impaired, which means you only accomplish escalating the misery you wanted to leave behind by living as a vegetable in a hospital bed without the ability to try and kill yourself again because you'll be hooked up to a ventilator and watched for the rest of your miserable life. And that's the worst case scenario. After you send your email and while you wait for the volume to kick in deep, you can lay down on the bed and pull the clear plastic bag over your head, you know, just to get the feel of it. Then, for me, I'd probably pick up my iPad and do the New York Times Wordle for the day. I would have already shut off all my phone stuff so no one could pin my location, by the way. And then I'd try and do the hard level of Sudoku. And when your Valium has kicked in fully, you can turn on the spigot of one of the helium tanks and secure the bag around your head with some tape. But leave some room so some helium can escape. You don't need to make a perfect seal. Just make it airtight enough to inflate. But there should be enough leakage room to let the excess helium escape. You don't need to create a balloon, a big balloon around your head that is so puffy or full of pressure that it pulls the clear trash bag away from the tape on your neck and your shoulder area. Your shoulder area. And the bag should not make you feel claustrophobic because it's large and clear and your Valium should take that fear away. Now turn on the spigots only a fraction, just enough so you can hear the tiniest amount of helium escaping from the back. Then you turn on helium tank number two spigot, but turn that number two spigot just a fraction more than the first. This ensures that if either tank runs out or falters, one of the tanks will keep uh, relinquishing the suffocating gas into your little bubble. Then lay on the bed on your back. As a last check, make sure the helium spewing end of the tube is near your ear and taped on your chest so the tubes don't slip. Then make sure again your large clear trash bag is pulled over your head and secure it again if needed. By the time your bag is sealed enough and you make your last checks, you will feel sleepy. So sleep in less less than an hour or two, you should be dead. Ta-da! Oh, that was dark, really dark. I can actually picture in my head how far to the ground every listener's jaw has fallen to. And I really don't know what more I should write in this episode other than maybe, hey, next episode will be better. I will add that this suicide note is not a cry for help or a warning. Maybe it's just my way of processing the tragedies I've suffered or the tragedies of others I've known or heard about in the news, not to mention all the podcasts that I've listened to. Or maybe I'm just a sociopathic narcissist who I'm just a sociopathic narcissist who wants attention. 
In any case, I promise you this is not a writing gimmick and I do not want to trigger or hurt anyone. It's just my stream of consciousness and something I'm going through that I felt was worth sharing. I believe when one dies, one is never sick, poor, or sad. And yet, if you kill yourself, you'll have to deal with the fact that you killed yourself. And that's going to make you sad even after you die. So don't do that. But in life, I think if you can just get to a place where you can stop contemplating negative things, which is something I think we can all control to some level, healthier, a lot richer, and a lot happier. Robert Browning called this trait the spark that many a man may desecrate but never quite lose. I have felt that spark before. And like I said, I hope to feel that spark again. But wait a minute, I I have to say something. If anyone is thinking of becoming a crazy motherfucker shooter of innocent people and they want to use my suicide method, that's okay. I want you to use my suicide method. And you can thank me in your PDF suicide note. But please kill yourself before you kill another person. Because when you get to the other side, you'll only have your own death and karma to deal with. And that would, you know, not be good. I don't empathize with anger. I don't empathize with anger, hate, self-hate, and depths of despair and frustration that has propelled these fucking assholes who have walked into birthday parties, concerts, schools, and workplaces, and then shot and killed other people in the past decade or so. What the fuck? Why did they have to hurt or kill other people who were probably full of hope, promise, and self-love? The world that those pansies gave up on needed those people. I need them. I need them. I need them to inspire me to get out of my own shit and to carry on and to get on with it. I wish I could have talked to all of those shooters before they did what they did. I would have told them that their particular situation of misery and self-loathing mixed with their hate and their addiction to social media didn't give them the right or template or excuse to be a fucking lemming and copy mass shooting trends. I get it. If I clicked on a quarter of the clickbait news that told of each day's new shootings, I become a fanatical mental fuckbomb shooter too. Because reading that shit over and over is like a manifesto for a depressed and hopeless mind. I just wish shooters had the balls to kill themselves before they killed other people. Again, if you're thinking of shooting others, please use my suicide method first. I'll leave you with this quote. The most important thing you do every day you live is deciding not to kill yourself. That's by Albert Camus. And if he were alive today, I think he'd also add that the second most important thing to do every day is to cause no harm to others. Thanks for listening. New episodes drop most every Monday. To know more about me, John David, or read my books, as well as listen to the podcast episodes of My Mother, just go to mafiahairdresser.com. Don't forget to like and subscribe and comment at will. I am Mafia Hairdresser on social media.